are, are the living entity in that service delivery system. And everybody like in the school system that is in a warehouse situation, whether it's a nursing home or assisted living or whatever, no matter how rich or whatever, essentially gets a daily piece of money that comes from Medicaid. Yeah. That money does not all have to be spent on taking care of the person. It goes into the overhead of the facility, into management, and so on and so forth. Those organizations invariably hire low-income people, mostly women, mostly uh, diverse women in terms of, of their, their, their right. identity. And so what you have is a, 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 a bottom operation culturally and socially in our society where we are all, we are all headed inevitably headed. Now, people may not want to recognize that, but I'm sure everybody knows in their heart of hearts in our current medical market system that there is a sense of deep fear and insecurity about something happening to you that you may not be able to cope with or afford to deal with directly. Yeah. And the result is that we all operate in a very, very tense very apprehensive, very stress-laden, conscious or unconscious state of being. Now, that may not impact people in their 20s, 30s, or 40s, but as you get a little bit older, 50s and 60s, all of a sudden you begin thinking about there's only so much more time left, and look at all the people that you've experienced that have gone before you that have wound up in concentration camp situations. Willowbrook was the ultimate cancer in the United States of a concentration camp, an American concentration camp. The death rate was 10 times the death rate of New York City. Uh, the circumstances in that place were absolutely barbarous, barbarous in the extreme. And my book details that in, in, in very, very substantial you know, a narrative, as well as extensive photographs of the violence of the institution on the, on the, on the heads of the people that were incarcerated there. Let me let me ask you something because you you mentioned that you came there in I think it was 1977. Uh, you said 1970. 1970. Okay. All right. So so really the 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 the, the public awareness of this was just beginning to transform. The the, the bull and flew over the cuckoo's nest was was written. You remember know, that the, earlier, but the movie hadn't come out until like oh at 76 or something like that. Remember that the cuckoo's nest was a story of a psychiatric facility. Right. And the public has a whole different cultural take on people that they perceive as nuts as opposed yeah. to they perceive as having a disability, cognitive disability or physical disability or medical disability. There's a, there's a sharp difference. And the problem in New York, one of the problems, apart from the monetization of this surplus population uh, to, to essentially you know, bankroll the state and to provide enormous profits to the Rockefeller brothers, the governor and his brother, David, who ran all the major banks uh -huh. in the state of New York, um, you know, was, was that they essentially made their money at the front end of these institutions and building them and contracting resources for them. Once they were built, they were no longer of any interest at all to the governor. Right. And when, when the situation broke loose in Willowbrook as a result of Geraldo Rivera's marvelous ABC coverage of the crisis. That uh, Geraldo was a very beloved friend of ours. He was a lawyer. His name was Jerry R Rivers. And uh, all of a sudden he became Geraldo Rivera. And when, when my colleague who was working with me at Willowbrook was fired by the director for meeting with parents on the grounds, uh, he came in and, and did this spectacular show. Uh, and then Dick Cabot did a follow-up show with us on, uh, on his program in order to thwart the possibility of our house being bombed, you know, as a result of the expose. I mean, it was wow. an extraordinary adventure, I got to tell you. All of it is, is articulated in my book. So yeah. let me just say that the place, the place was beyond imagination. There's a magnificent fiction book just written by a woman named um, uh, uh, Ellen Marie Wiseman. Okay. Ellen Marie Wiseman, and the book is called The Lost Girls of Willowbrook. And it's the inside story, all fiction, all fiction, 100% fiction, 
inside story of an identical twin teener, teenager who finds out that her teen sister, who she thought was dead because of her parents' uh, misinformation, had been put at Willowbrook. And she had disappeared, and they were calling to find out if, if uh, the, you know, we knew that, that she was gone. And so she right away jumps on a bus and heads to Willowbrook in order to offer her services to help them find her, her identical twin. When she walks in, she doesn't have her identity card, and they jump on her thinking she's the missing girl. Mm-hmm. And she yeah. gets thrown into the pit of this monstrous place. Yeah, and, a, a uh, dramatic way of illustrating the, just the whole it, kind of horrors it, that went on. It was really hard for me to read past the fourth chapter. Me, I mean, I had yeah. I was the one that was on the inside, and and that this book is so awful in terms of how what the experience was of being a victim inside the place. Yeah. So so this this story again the the, the book is called the Lost Girls of Willowbrook, and I urge people to look at that. Uh, Ellen and I are very dear friends, and she invited me to come to New York with her when she when her book came out. It was the number one selling book at Amazon and and Barnes and Noble and so forth for that month. So the story about Willowbrook, I I knew that we had institutions in California. There were seven or eight major institutions for people with developmental disabilities in the state of California at that time, and my teacher essentially ran a program precisely to deflect people from segregated congregate care, institutionalization. Our job is to keep kids out of the institution and support the family in the maximum degree with public health nursing, with, uh, with, with psychology, with, uh, with social workers, with speech and hearing therapists. And then we had the backup of this incredible uh, group of, uh, of specialists at Children's Hospital. We could order anything, metabolic stuff, genetic stuff, whatever it was, in order to make sure the family was well supported and understood that there was no place like home (laughs) and and there was no service like the family service that was bonded to the child because anything after that you're talking about shift staff morning afternoon and nighttime staff alienated underpaid essentially trained to see the people that they're caring for as less than human whether they had a developmental disability or were just old just oh, just old. But once you get too old, you wind up in a stereotyped, uh, stigmatized body of people. Yeah. The body of people that Hitler, for example, exterminated right at the beginning of his final solution in their society. They started with our constituency of, of yeah. uh, people with, with disabilities. And then they went on from there to deal with the trade union movement, the communist yeah. community, the Slavic community, et cetera, et cetera. But once the die was cast, and the die has been cast in America for a long time so that any, any situation that puts you into a place where you become part of a devalued group, you are set up to be exterminated depending upon the administration of the country. And you can see particularly what's going on now. We have great concern. We need to end. We need to end this segregated congregate solution and replace it with universal Single payer, rightful yeah. healthcare as a public good, not a commodity. There should be no money exchange at the point of service for any medical needed service, and that includes people uh, being educated and handled in a habilitation framework. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, we're speaking with Dr. William Bronston. He's the author of Public Hostage, Public Ransom, Ending Institutional. Uh, America. I, I, I want to ask, uh, you know, kind of a, a follow up on to uh, that one. Uh, while this is often, you know, dealt with through through Medicaid, I, I have seen uh, personally, uh, you know, in, in my family, you know, services be reduced under the under the Medicare uh, system because of the quote unquote, you know, Medicare Advantage uh, uh, program. Uh, which allows uh, for uh, companies which operate those programs to essentially, you know, reduce, at, you know, at their uh, at their uh, will the amount of services they provide as long as they, you know, take general care of of, of everything. And and I, I refer to it on this program as Medicare disadvantage because yeah. because it it cuts in these massive uh, companies 
to make a profit off of people by providing ultimately fewer services. And I think that's, that's, right. that, that's, that, that's discussing. What have you seen with that? And, and what do we need to do to, to end a system that exploits individuals uh, for the profit of these massive companies? So understand that the medical market system represents 18 plus percent of the gross domestic product of the United States of America. Yeah. That is, apart from the military, we're maybe the next largest block of money. And the whole effort is to expand the privatization of the delivery system to prevent the transformation of our medical market system into a true healthcare system. So Medicare Advantage is a total misnomer. You're correct. It should be called Medicare disadvantage. Yeah. What's happening is that it is an effort to privatize, that is to buy out the assets of Medicare and to move people out of traditional Medicare with its 2% overhead right. into a system that has 20 to 30% overhead. That means that every dollar you put in, the system can take out 20 cents to 30 cents that goes into their pockets, not into the care for you. Right. And uh, essentially, you are then uh, assigned to a narrow network of providers. You can't go to any place like you can with Medicare. With Medicare, you can go to any provider, any doctor, any dentist, whatever, in order to get services, not with Medicare disadvantage. And right yeah. now is the period when the Medicare Advantage industry, which is CVS and Rite Aid and all of these. Mega- oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're seeing the commercials everywhere nowadays. That's right. And they're calling you on the telephone in order to get you to, to, to move from traditional Medicare, genuine services, which even, even in Medicare, you have to have a secondary because you're still responsible for 20% of the cost of medical services, even with Medicare. But I've had more than a million dollars worth of medical services easily. I mean, I had six-way bypass. I've had a hip replacement and so forth. And I don't pay a penny for my services. But I am paying about three to four hundred dollars a month for my medical services. And I just had a long-term care policy that I had been paying into for the last twenty years, funded essentially by my public employment retirement system here in California. Rescinded, rescinded, and I just real. I'm, all of a sudden, I'm getting seven hundred and eighty-five dollars a month back that had been deducted from my 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 salary, my my retirement apart apart from my medical coverage. Mm, wow. So so we're talking about big big money and the whole aim to privatize and to make sure that there is a gigantic population of administrative middlemen in the medical delivery system that add nothing, nothing to care. Yeah. Now, there's a whole difference between the culture of dealing with our constituency, Beowulf, kids with special needs and elders, mm-hmm. and the larger context of general medical and health service needs. In order to fix the problem, the only true comprehensive, assured fix is to end the current economic system that funds our medical services and establish a single payer, that is a single trust fund at the state level and at the national level that has 100% of all medical dollars in it that essentially uh, are expanded a small amount by a minor progressive tax to the public, where everybody would have a single tier of Cadillac quality care, one one tier of care. You could not buy out of that system. It would outlaw private insurance entirely and end the whole domination of the middleman in the current market system that's called our healthcare system, which is not a healthcare system at all. Absolutely. I, I am absolutely in favor of outlawing the uh, the for-profit medical insurance industry. I think I think there's a major should... effort going on in Oregon. Major effort going on in Oregon yeah. to establish single payer health care. There's a guy named Mike Huntington that's one of the key coordinators in your state and I can give you contact information on him. Here in California we have a bill that's pending in January called CalCare. At the national level, the a congresswoman from Washington State 
Pramila Jayapal has a very, very fine single-payer bill. Bernie Sanders on the Senate side, very fine.